So Mark chapter 10 is where we're going to be, and uh, we've been talking, we, we, we kicked off last Sunday talking our last core value, which is life on life, generations, legacy of disciples, which is really the heart and the vision of Summit Church. And Mark has been, uh, in his gospel, has been teaching about discipleship for the last few chapters. He's been teaching about life on life. He's been mentioning different things about what this looks like and what discipleship ought to be like. And then he gives us a story where <clears throat> basically um, he gives us a story about looking at discipleship from a blind man and four things that we really ought to, um, four markers that really ought to be in our lives as a disciple. And so I want to look at this interaction between Bartimaeus, or you can call him Bart, um, I may refer to him as Bart a little bit this morning, um, but Bartimaeus, uh, we're going to look at this story, um, and we're going to look at discipleship from a blind man, but we're going to start in verses 42 and go through 52 of Mark chapter 10. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. Jesus is talking to his disciples. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And so what, we, what we've got to realize, and you may have heard me say this before, that we're never more like Jesus when we serve, right? That we're never more like Jesus when we, when we serve, because, right, Jesus is laying out here that the religious leaders, the religious rulers, you look at verse 42, there of the Gentiles lorded over them, right? They lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, right? They're the boss and they wanted everybody to know that they were in charge, right? Authority was a big deal. And, and so they would lord things over people, right? They would hold things over their heads. They would let everyone, in know, everyone know that they're in charge, right? And Jesus basically says, this isn't the way. This isn't the way to lead. This isn't the way that, that, that I want you to lead, that I want you to go forth, right? Because Jesus is talking to them about going forth. He says, in fact, it shall be among you that whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, Jesus, referring to himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Keep reading. Verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprung up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now, again, there's four things, right, that, that, that Jesus has called us to be a servant, and there's four things that I want us to see from the life of Bart here, right, that, that we ought to imitate, that we ought to take on ourselves if we are going to be a disciple of Jesus. And then next week, I want us to talk about our responsibility with this. But first, I want to deal with us, right, as, as it relates to Bartimaeus. And the first thing that I want you to notice about um, about Bartimaeus is that he's not confused about Jesus. He's not confused about the person of Jesus. Look back, to, look, look back at the story here. He starts out and he says, and we heard that, that it was Jesus of Nazareth. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, right? He knew that. Later on, he refers to Jesus as rabbi. And so Bartimaeus is not confused here about who Jesus is. Right? Because rabbi, um, in this time, 
right, meant anointed one. Jesus as the Messiah, the anointed one. Rabbi, which was a term that was used in prayer to address God. And so, and so Bartimaeus is recognizing here who the authority is, right, which is Jesus. And it translates as my great master. And so Bartimaeus, even in calling out to Jesus, is submitting himself to him. And so Bartimaeus knew that he was speaking to both Christ and Lord. John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. When Jesus is praying uh, to his Father in the garden on his way to the cross, he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. I love how Jordan... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I love how Jordan, I uh, clearly wasn't planning on this, um, but I love how Jordan uh, talked about the studies that they were doing, right? And, and, and how, to, how to stand on the truth of God's word in the confusion of the world, right? And, 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 and I think when, when um, let, me, let me get this right, because I don't want to be, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to get this wrong. Um, I, I think... When we talk about the lordship of Christ, Jesus being Lord of our lives, Jesus being in control, Jesus having authority over our lives, Jesus being in charge and control of the church, because that's what we're saying. When Jesus is Lord of the church, we're saying that Jesus is in control. Jesus is the senior pastor, right? Jesus calls the shots here. That's our goal, right? When we merged and became Summit Church, we asked the question, what would Summit Church look like if Jesus was the senior pastor of Summit Church? That's how we tried to build this thing, right? That's how we tried to do that. And when we do that, right, we come in full submission, right? But yet when you think about submission to Jesus in the context of culture, he didn't really mean that. Right? Did he really mean that? Well, you got to look at the context, right? And so even, even scripture, right, foundational biblical scriptural truths are being questioned today, right, that we would have never thought had been questioned, including, including the authority and the supremacy and the providence of Jesus Christ. And Bartimaeus was clear. Bartimaeus was clear on who Jesus was. And all I'm saying this morning is that if we are going to be a disciple of Jesus, we've got to be clear about who Jesus is, right? We've got to be clear about who Jesus is. We've all met that friend, right? We've all met that friend. We've all been in that relationship, right? We've all had that coach. Uh, all, we've all had that boss, right? Where it was good for a season, right? I mean, let's even, let's even go a step further. We've all had that pastor, haven't we? That we thought was awesome for six months, right? We, we've had that friend, that boss, that pastor, right? That coworker, right? That we got along with really, really well in the beginning. You know what they call that? The honeymoon period right? And that works both ways. Because you know what they tell pastors, young pastors in school? That if you want to buy something, do it within the first 18 months. Because you're not going to get it after that. The honeymoon period will be over. So that works both ways, right? That the pastor comes in, he's got a honeymoon period with the church, right? The church comes in, they've got a honeymoon period with the pastor. And it works all across all circles, right? Relationships, friendships, new jobs, workplaces, bosses, coworkers, all these different things, right? Andy, open your eyes. <laughs> Andy's back there dozing off in his own brother's sermon. Unbelievable. Wake up, son. Okay. <laughs> he keeps bobbing his head. Mom, put him to bed on time. Okay, anyway. 
Where was I? Right. We've all had that relationship, right? Where it was good for a season, right? But then you start to uncover the layers of who that person really is. You start to uncover some past hurts, right? You walk through some things. You walk through some tensions in relationship, right? You walk, you walk through some hard moments in your job, right? And the whole, the whole mantra, right? The whole leadership world says that if there's no tension, then there's no growth, right? That if you just keep it surface level, right, then, then you can be that and you can be shallow for as long as you want to, right? But in order to have a real close friend, a friend that sticks closer than the brother, right? In order to have a real relationship with your job, a real connection with what you do, right? Then there's got to be tension at times that you overcome that draws you closer, right? And that happens with Jesus, right? That happens with Jesus, We have a honeymoon period with Jesus, right? Where we feel like, man, in the beginning, our prayers, he's hearing everything, right? Look at God move, right? We have that eternal perspective. We have that, we we see God moving everywhere, right? The parking space at Walmart, the closest one that you can get is open. Thank you, Lord right? That's all thanks to him, right? Dunkin' Donuts forgets to charge you for your donut. Oh, praise Jesus. You won't believe it, right? You walk up into church testifying, right? Right? And, and we have, we have all of that, right? And then, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, right? We, it shifts where everything's God's fault, right? Where everything's God's fault. The honeymoon period is over. We stop thanking him for things, We stop seeing him in those small areas of our life, right? Things get hard. It feels like our prayers aren't even hitting hitting the ceiling. And what changed? What changed? I mean, if we truly believe another foundational belief about God, right? And if we truly believe that God never changes, he didn't change. So what changed? Our perspective changed, right? Our perspective changed. Our relationship changed, right? And, 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 and so we've got to look at that. We've got to consider that. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. He says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. We got to know who Jesus is, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which has now been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher. We've got to keep going. Which is why I suffer as I do, but I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. What Paul is telling Timothy is the importance of knowing whom you have believed. Right? The importance of guarding the deposit that's been entrusted to him. Right? And so Paul's telling Timothy, listen, this has been deposited into me. This is the calling that was calling before Jesus, right? Even came to earth, right? This is the deposit entrusted to me. And Jesus, knowing the person and work of Jesus, growing in my relationship with him is essential to that deposit, to being who God's called me to be. So we've got to know who Jesus is. Bartimaeus, this blind beggar, right, hears that it's Jesus, immediately calls out Jesus. Immediately calls out Jesus. Then he then even says, Rabbi, right? A place, a term of submission that you're in control. Bartimaeus was clear on who Jesus was. Number two, Bartimaeus was not stopped by opposition. We see the religious crowd, verse 42, um, excuse me, sorry, verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, telling him to be silent. So, excuse me, here we see the religious crowd effect, right? That a bunch of the religious people got together with their own agendas and in effect 
shut out those that really need help. Have you seen that happen before? That a bunch of that a bunch of people with their own agendas got together and 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 effectively shut out those that really needed help. But my point is not the crowds necessarily, but the fact that the more they tried to silence Bartimaeus, the louder he cried out. And this points to a great truth that genuine faith is not quieted by opposition. When troubles come, we persist. When troubles come, we persist. Persist. Why can't I say that? Persist. That's not a word. We persist. We persist. Kristen and Mike are going to have a blast with that all day long. That we persist. We persist. When troubles come in our faith, we persist. I'll never forget when I applied for my first senior pastor job at South Coast, right? And my only, I guess. <laughs> right? Um, at, at for, well, and then there was Summit, and I kind of had to apply. I kind of had to interview for that. To have to, anyway, 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 right? I, I'll, never, I'll never forget. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a Friday, and, and Kristen and I were, were trying to figure out God's will as to where we were supposed to be. And, uh, and Kristen prayed as we were pulling out of a campground, God dropping in our lap. God drop in our lap, whether we're supposed to go to Maine, whether we're supposed to go back to North Carolina and just serve faithfully, drop it in our lap. I dozed off because I had spoken a lot that week at camp and was, was wiped out. We drove to Gastonia uh, and, and, uh, for dinner, South Carolina, and, uh, and not Gastonia. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Wherever the outlets are down in South Carolina. Y'all know that place. Um, and, we, and we drove there and my phone rings. And it's the, it's the head of the search committee at South Coast. And they said, here's the deal. Um, we've got a top three and a backup top three. And if we're to rank you, you're number five out of six. Sweet. And he said, how does that make you feel? <laughs> I kid you not. True story. True story. He said, how does that make you feel? I love talking about this because it's so reaffirming of the fact that God, God was in total control of the fact that I'm here. So if you've got issue with it, talk to him. Okay. All right. All right. He's like, how does that make you feel? And I said, well, can I be honest with you? And he said, please. And I said, well, my wife prayed about 45 minutes ago that, that God would drop in our lap where we're supposed to be. And you called me. So I believe God just told me that I'm your next pastor. So you do whatever you've got to do to figure that out. <laughs> Silence <laughs> on the other line. You don't tell the Southern Baptist that, okay? But he, but he, he, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to do, and so we talked for another half hour. Two months went by, right? Two months, like two and a half months went by. We had almost forgotten about Maine, and he calls me on a Wednesday night about nine o'clock, and, and he's defeated. And he says, so here's what's happened. We pursued a candidate. They're out. Everybody else has either moved on, not interested, found another job, blah, blah, blah. You're all we've got. <laughs> it's not that funny. So either you're our next pastor, you're our next pastor, or we've got to drop back and figure out. And this was already the second search team. The Champas went through this whole thing. Um, God works in mysterious ways. And so I was called here. Submitted my resume, I think it was June, June 7th or something like that, and finally got called to be the pastor uh, the week after Christmas. That was a long process. Kristen and I's timeline was a little bit different than that. We thought we'd submit our resume the 1st of June. The way churches work in the South is that we would have been in place and moved up here by August. We're a little slower up here <laughs> in making decisions. But who would have been the pastor if they would have made a decision by August? Right? 
God worked it out. And sometimes that takes longer than we want it to. But don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Bartimaeus, right, was being silenced by the religious folk that didn't want Jesus to be bothered. We see this happen, right? The disciples even trying to, trying to shoo the kids away, right? And Jesus is like, hey, let the children come close, right? We see it happen in a few different, we saw it happen with Zacchaeus, right? Who in the world was Zacchaeus that Jesus would want to spend the evening with him in his home, right? We see it happen throughout scripture that the greatest stories that we celebrate in scripture come from the least likely who had to persevere, who had to, who had to stand against opposition in some way, right? To have the encounter with Jesus that they had. And let me submit to you, I know this might sound familiar to last week, but let me submit to you that if we keep going, the greatest blessing is ahead. That's why we say all the time that the church's best days are ahead of her. The church's best days are ahead of her. And that's not because of a new building. That's not because of, that's not because of moving to a middle school and going poor. That's not because of any of that. The church's best days are ahead of her. Why? Because if we stay focused, and if we continue to persevere, and if we continue to walk through the doors that God's opened, and if we continue to be faithful to the message, and if people continue to meet Him, and we continue to see baptisms, and we continue to see God move, then He is accomplishing His work through His bride, the church. The opposition didn't stop Him. The opposition didn't stop Him. It didn't stop him. If anything, he got louder. He got louder. He he shouted louder. Number three, we got to move. They're warming up upstairs. Number three, Bartimaeus was not hindered by stuff. He wasn't hindered by stuff. He wasn't confused about who Jesus was, not stopped by the opposition. He wasn't hindered by stuff. Look at verse 50. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. See, Jesus stood still. Even facing the cross soon, he still heard the cries of the needy and stopped. And when Jesus called Bartimaeus to come, he threw down his coat. Now, here's the significance of that. His coat would have been a large garment that would have probably been a mat for him in this time, as well as a protection from the cold and the cold July days of Maine that we have, right? As, a, as well as a protection from the cold. This would have probably been his most valuable, valued possession, his cloak, because it was used for many different things. And, and it, 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 so, it, so commentators say, Probably his most valued possession, crucial to his survival. And he cast it aside for Jesus. Throwing his cloak down, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Obvious, right? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Lord, let me cover, recover my sight. Here, here's, the, here's the application for this, okay? We must guard against busyness in our lives to the point that we don't care for others. We must guard against busyness in our lives to the point that we don't care for hurting people, that we don't care for hurting family, that we don't care for church members. I've got some news for you this morning that might be a little hard to hear. We need to remember, and I'm saying we, I'm including myself into this, okay? We need to remember that our schedule is really not that important. In the eyes of eternity... Right In the eyes of eternity and the lordship of who Jesus is, our schedule is secondary to his will. We can make plans. What does the scripture say? Right, Our plans are like folly in comparison to his ways. Right, right, right. We can make plans all we want to. But if our plans, right, what we say last week, good things become bad things when they take the place of the best thing. Right? If our plans are inhibiting the move of God, then we've got to look at that, right? 
I love what I love what a pastor says. He says we need to stop praying for a move of God and be the move of God. We've got to stop praying for a move of God. We are the move of God. But yet, how many of us would sit around the circle? Kind of like we talked about last week. How many of us would sit around the circle when we're talking about being the move of God, right? How are we going to be the move of God? How many of us would say, well, I'm too busy. You guys have fun. Let me know how it goes. Right? How many of us would say, I'm too tired? Right? I mean, I'm, too, I'm too tired. I got to sit this one out. But you guys, hey, I'm cheering you on. You guys let me know how it goes. Right? Right? Bartimaeus wasn't inhibited by his stuff. He wasn't, he wasn't hindered by his stuff. Okay, and then last, uh, lastly, number four, Bartimaeus wasn't looking for a quick fix. Look at verse 52. Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Followed him on the way, right? Bartimaeus just didn't get what he asked for and left, right? Which, which this, is, this is a fascinating point to me, right? This is a fascinating piece of scripture to me that sometimes, right, Jesus handled every single one of his healings a little bit differently, right? We can compare this one to the man that was lowered uh, through the roof, right, with the four friends that dug a hole through the roof. They lowered him before Jesus, right, because he, he saw his faith and healed him, right? His faith healed him, right? But, but uh, excuse me, he healed his heart first before he, he was healed physically, right? And so, and so we see that piece of it. Your faith has made you well. But for that guy, he said, go home, don't tell a soul, right? And yet, for, and yet for this, for Bartimaeus, right, he let Bartimaeus follow him, right? He said Bartimaeus got up and followed him. I'm sure the circumstances were different. The conditions were different. We don't know if the paralyzed man had a family to get home to. We didn't know what the, so that was earlier in Jesus's ministry. So was Jesus trying to keep a little more quiet what, what was going down, right? We don't know. But it was interest, it's interesting to me that Jesus handles those a little bit differently. And here, with the healing of Bartimaeus and his sight, Bartimaeus followed him, right? In one sense, he was looking for a quick fix that he wanted to see right then. However, it wasn't just fix my eyes and then go back to my merry way. After Jesus gave him his sight, he went from sitting beside the road to following Jesus. To following Jesus. Listen, if we are to be a disciple of Jesus. We can't be confused about who Jesus is. We've got to know Him. We've got to be in relationship with Him. Not stopped by opposition. Right? Keep going. Keep going. Keep showing up for that coffee, even when they ghost you three times. Right? Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Keep being there. Not hindered by stuff. Throw away the, the cloak, the most prized possession, crucial for our survival, right? What's keeping us? Is our busy schedules keeping us and not looking for a quick fix? We're going to talk about it next week, but a little sneak preview, okay? A little sneak peek, okay? That when we sign up for discipleship, right? When we sign on to be a disciple of Jesus, it's a lifelong course. It's a lifelong course. Right? How many of you have tried to stop something that you've loved and something that you've been addicted to right immediately? It's hard. It's hard, right? I'm trying to find like a three-month runway, maybe next sabbatical in a few years, to give up coffee because I'm, I'm fearful of who the person I'm going to be when I give up coffee for a long time, okay? And you're not going to want that. And my family needs space from me in that season. They've already told me that, right? But they keep telling me, they keep trying to encourage me, hey, you should really give this up, pal, right? Eight cups of coffee and one cup of water a day is perfect, right? Keeps the doctor away. That's, that's an exaggeration. That's an exaggeration. I'm down to six. Okay, um, <laughs> right? But, but they keep encouraging. And I'm like, I, don't, I need the runway, right? I need the runway. Not hindered by stuff, right? And... and, and, and um, not looking for a quick fix. When we sign on for discipleship, it's a lifelong. It's a lifelong. It's a lifelong. All right. Anybody ever heard of Fanny Crosby? Yes. Yes. I thought some of you might have heard of Fanny Crosby. I was reading about her yesterday. She wrote over 9,000 hymns in her life. 9,000 hymns. She played some of them, at, 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 or, or some of them have been played at presidents' funerals. 
Okay? I won't read all of these. I, I didn't print out all 9,000. Okay? But, I, but some of them that you'll recognize. All the way my Savior leads me. Blessed assurance. Jesus is tenderly calling you home. I am thine, O Lord. My Savior, first of all, near the cross. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Praise Him. Praise Him. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Rescue the perishing, safe in the arms of Jesus. To God be the glory. But you know something about Fanny Crosby? She was blind. She was never bitter about her disability. At age eight, she wrote these verses about her condition. Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't to weep and sigh because I'm blind. I cannot and I won't. What a perspective. What a perspective. A couple years ago, I was playing golf, and on the first hole, I got stung by a bee right over my eye, and my eye swelled shut, and I went a Saturday without being able to see, and it was so aggravating. I was so frustrated. When our abilities are taken away, how frustrated do we get? When we hurt something, when there's an injury, when there's a surgery, right? And we can't do the things that we would normally do. How frustrated do we get? Yet this eight-year-old, this child's perspective, oh, what a happy soul I am. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep inside because I'm blind, I cannot. And I won't. I'm sure I'm sure. And we don't read about them. I haven't read about them. I'm sure that Fanny had some hard days, some days where she was frustrating, frustrated. She later remarked, it seemed intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life. And I thank him for that dispensation. If perfect earthly sight were offered me tomorrow, I would not accept it. I might not have sung hymns to the praise of God if I had been distracted by the beautiful and interesting things about me. She also once said, when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. She composed her poems and hymns entirely in her mind and then dictated them to someone else. She was said to work mentally on as many as 12 hymns at once before dictating them out. Not hindered. Not hindered. Seeing Jesus as Lord, knowing who Jesus was, clearly she couldn't wait to, 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 to get to heaven to see the face of Jesus. That was the first face she was going to see. Not hindered by her stuff, working on these things in her mind, up to 12 hymns and dictating them out. Right? I'm sure there were naysayers. And she rose above never quitting. The worship team is going to come. And I just want to ask you, very simply, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who Jesus is? How's your relationship with Him? What opposition is standing in your way from being a disciple of Jesus? Are you hindered by stuff or busyness? Are you just looking for a quick fix? The life of a disciple is not that. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me daily. Moment by moment. In every decision. In every decision. I know it's become cliche and fad, and, but what would Jesus do in every decision? What would Jesus say in every conversation? How would Jesus respond? In every moment. That's a disciple of Jesus. And that's my prayer for us. That's my prayer for us. Is that we model ourselves after that life of Bartimaeus. Who once he was healed. Once he saw. Followed Jesus with everything he had. Will you pray with me? God I pray. That you stir in our hearts to be more like Bartimaeus. God, to not allow stuff to hinder us, to not allow the opposition to stand in our way. God, to know You, to know You fully. God, to not look for a quick fix, a band-aid, 
but that, God, we would give our lives to you. And God, I know many of us have, and maybe some of us in this room need to be reminded and encouraged today to fight the fight. Keep the faith. Keep pursuing you with our lives. Not giving up, but following you. Denying ourselves, taking up our cross each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray.